A lot of times I get attacked for my sexuality, especially from religious people online. And so I spend time kind of poking fun at them because they're the number one consumers of my content. It's like, you're so homophobic, but you're watching me more than my audience watches me. I'm Louis Cole. Welcome to the Recharged Podcast. In this series, I invite fellow content creators and artists to explore exciting ways to make a difference in the world. I take my guests to visit local social good projects in my self-converted electric 1973 Volkswagen van. We have real and raw conversations about life and hear from social good heroes that we can all be inspired by. On today's podcast, our guest is Amber Whittington, an actor, host, LGBTQ plus advocate, activist, former professional basketball player and star of the successful YouTube channel Amber's Closet. She started her channel to help others that may be struggling with their identity to break stereotypes using comedy, vlogging and honest conversation, as well as to showcase her unique androgynous tomboy style. She has now built a social following of almost 2 million. Amber believes in changing the world by changing within. Her goal is to empower everyone through positivity, self-love and self-confidence so they feel inspired to show their true authentic self to the world and to show up as the best versions of themselves. Welcome back to the podcast. Today I have Amber Whittington, from Amber's Closet. Hey, hey. Thanks for joining. It's been a bit of a mission trying to like coordinate dates and like find a time that works, but yeah, thanks course. for uh, coming, coming and being a part of my podcast. Yeah, thanks for picking me up. I'm already having elephant. So me and Amber met a few years ago, actually at, what was it, Vlog University or something? That event, I think it was that event I, Justine, was putting on. Oh, is that where we I met? So. Oh, we might have met before that, but that's, yeah. I feel like that's where we first met. Oh, that's where we real connect, yeah. That's right. And I just want to say off the bat, before we dive in, I have just been, ever since we've met, just been so inspired by you. And out of all the creators and influencers I know, like, I don't know anyone as passionately, like, doing real, really doing activism and really, like, fighting for social justice. And, and I just wanted to say that, that I feel oh. super inspired by you. Wow, coming from you, that's a lot. Thank you. <laughs> that's um, crazy, because I feel inspired because I feel like you live it. Like you li literally live your truth. You know what I mean? I can like break, like pull away for a second to, with my sanity, but you live your truth at all times. So you inspire me too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I feel like you are just standing for kind of um, oppressed, marginalized communities. And I just would love to know, like, did that start from a young age? What were their significant stories in your life that really like made you passionate because that's what I feel I just feel so much passion oh, from yeah. you with it all the two things came to mind when you started talking about it was one being called an n-word to my face so like aggressively and to by this grown and I was three years old by the way um, three years old I was in a convenience store and this and we were in the south and this guy walks up to me and just starts pointing at me and just like you, you, like spitting at me saying it and so I ended up having to go like walk to my mom and ask her what it was and I was like what does in word mean and then she just freaked out and was like where did you hear it from so anyways they had to explain it to me at a very young age and I had to realize that I'm living in a world of people that hate me just because I'm biracial it's very energy draining because essentially like it is a fight like yeah. it's a constant fight right you're constantly Absolutely. that's what it feels like you're like and, on edge on your toes having to like worry about and then and, and i'm also talking from a super privileged position of being a white straight man like and i still feel like as i start dipping my toes into more activism it's like whoa this is hard and i'm like mm -hmm. the one that's least affected by any like i'm not oppressed in any way really like do you know what i mean so it's like yeah. to, to fight and you're coming from a place of being oppressed it's a lot. Yeah. But that's another reason why I appreciate your voice so much is because you're able to say that and then and express what's going on because we're over here fighting for, you know what I'm saying, someone with your privilege to even understand what we're going through. But look, look right, I mean, we're passing, my street is Skid Row pretty much now, right? So every day that I walk outside, it's a, it's a, I, I'm going through it all over again because I'm helping out. I know these people by name. You know, and I'm trying to help them out. I sometimes see creators will use 
giving homeless people money as a clickbait thing and it's right, like not right, right. really tackling the issue and it's very much like sure like i'm sure if you handed a wad of money to somebody on the street they'd be very grateful right, but right. it's not it's it's not solving any problems it's not especially uh, because you don't know their background yeah. there's there's people that are on the street that i know if i give them five bucks they're gonna go eat and then there's others that i know that even if i buy them a candy bar they're gonna go s try to trade it for some crack because yeah. that's happened before to me so i know you every every person is an individual in their circumstance this is the worst street right here mm. it, this part right here this is a resource center where they can well, eat at we're, night we're visiting this center now are Mid we really midnight, midnight mission yeah wow okay yeah so we're gonna go and chat to them and like learn a bit because i've been here a couple times and obviously you're way more knowledgeable so i'd love to hear from you as well but no like, i try to email them so many times so. I've, I've only like been here a couple times a couple of event, events but i don't even know the history of how things got this bad like there's mm. a little bit of it in venice in comparison i mean there's a lot of it in venice but i've, I've seen but this, this th is there are literally this street right here there is individuals especially women right there that don't even have a blanket to lay on they're yeah. just laying and then our mayor our governor has recently released so many people from jail and from uh, mental wards and just put them on the street with nowhere to go. So it's yeah. just adding, 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 adding on top of the fact that a lot of people during the pandemic started suffering financially and ended up out here too. It's, cr it's just crazy. Today we're visiting Andrew Linares, a volunteer manager at the Midnight Mission, a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to providing a support system to people facing homelessness on Skid Row. They believe that every person deserves to live with stability and provide the structure and the resources that people experiencing homelessness need to truly improve their lives. They believe that everyone deserves to live with dignity no matter what they've been through. The Midnight Mission has been a consistent beacon of light for those with nowhere else to turn and runs one of the most efficient direct service operations in the country. We've arrived in Skid Row. This is Andrew from Midnight Mission and he's just going to, um, we're just going to walk around a little bit and hear a bit about what you guys are doing. And... One of the things that I love about the Midnight Mission is that during the 1930s it was known for having the resources to be able to feed you and give you clothing. We had a barber shop from the very from the very beginning because Tom Littlecoat did believe that changing someone's appearance from the outside can help you Absolutely. know Absolutely, how the they inside. feel on the inside, make, yeah. Make them feel good. And uh, in 1975, we ended up getting our healthy living program because the number of alcoholics on the streets became impactfully large here in Skid Row. So, we ended up introducing 12-step uh, recovery mm. into the program to help be able to battle that portion of homelessness. I've been referring, I often refer as homeless people, but to say a person experiencing homelessness, that's a better way of saying it, right? Because then it's like taking it away from that being their identity and it's just an experience they're currently going through. So one of the things that we believe, uh, be, uh, believe in here yeah. is there is no difference between them and us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only difference is the circumstance, mm -hmm. right? So when we hear people say the homeless, it just sounds nasty and degrading, mm -hmm. like not human, right? And like the best way that I can describe it is like for me being an openly gay man, mm -hmm. I also don't want to be categorized as part of the gays, right? Like yeah. it just sounds horrible. It just sounds like I'm a separate it's like kind an of human other being, thing, yeah, right? Yeah. But in reality, we're all human beings, right? We're mm -hmm. all brothers and sisters here. And you know, the only, the only difference is some of our lifestyles and for yeah. a lot of people here experiencing homelessness we, we like to say that or uh the unhoused populated population right? yeah because they're still human and you got to remember that mm -hmm. and so by you know changing just a little bit of the title it gives it gives them a chance to it humanizes open. them yeah yeah you know exactly yeah. So it's cool, always... it's cool to know that because i feel like it's just a slight change in the wording but mm -hmm. it's had such an impact on somebody and Absolutely. yeah it's good to know, it's good to know. It's, especially it's it's more encompassing of all the circumstances that bring people here right like you know it's it's so many more things than substance abuse which most people think right and then there's mental health is the, uh, one of the biggest and then on top of that circumstances like the pandemic and all that which which put people in a really bad financial situation and that's also included so it's like i feel like it's more inclusive of the, of the things that help, like that bring people to this situation Absolutely. that people need to be aware of right. because there's so many things that it's not one thing that's going to help this it's it's um, 
It's resources for substance abuse. It's uh, helping people counseling. with, yeah, yeah, counseling, mental health services, therapy, and 12-step programs, helping them build resumes and get job experience. Yeah. Like, we, there's so many things that and, we and need, they we need help with. We need, we, need, we need more faces. Like, I hate seeing the fact that we don't have housing, but we have, I see lots, like, just down the street on San Pedro that's used I for, just said that. That's on the way here, used for production nothing, films, right? Or nothing. That's, nothing. How many buildings? We can walk to my house from here. We're gonna pass at least five or six buildings that could house thousands of people. Yeah, this but is then, your big dream, right? This you is tell this it, is what bro. I've been saying forever. But then when I go to see what it would take to buy that house, meet a bunch of people, or buy the building with a bunch of people, we're blocked because we're blocked by people with money that say, hey, you can't buy this building if you're gonna aid in helping people in any way. We don't want that. The neighbors yeah. don't want that. The building's gonna uh, decrease in value, all these things. But instead, you have people live outside of the building. They say no to what we were looking at, Hotel Cecil, all these things. But instead, you just have people- These yeah. are empty. Most of them are empty. I, did he not say everything I said <laughs> I in the know. car? Yeah. I mean, but in the way of someone that's in working here, I just, I just encourage everybody to like do what you can. Like if you can volunteer or tell somebody else or use your platform to share it, do that please. There's, or, there's organizations like Midnight Mission that really need help. And I always say that, you know, if you can't do it, just like, even if it's buying two water bottles when you go into the gas station and giving it to somebody else, even that is helpful. Do what you can, even if it's that, something that small, it does make a big difference to somebody. So that's all I have to say. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Thank Thanks you. so much for showing us around and uh, yeah, thank yeah. You. I love hearing your story. I wanna hug you. I wanna hug you. <laughs> thank you for sharing your story. Absolutely. Thank you for being here to help. So, you know, really just walking down Skid Row and being like, whoa, like I live in such a bubble and I and I don't feel a guilt around it. It's not like I'm like, oh, I feel bad because I live to in a nice level of comfort and I have freedom and I have that security of, but I do feel like it's, it feels incredibly unfair and it feels like, and it does make me feel like this is, isn't just, this isn't, I don't deserve the life I have. Like I don't deserve this privilege. There's nothing about me that makes, like he said as well, it's like making that first step of realizing there's actually nothing different but right. other than our circumstance, you know? Because right. I'm grateful every, I. A couple times a day, I sit in my small meditation and say things I'm appreciative and grateful for. But then at the same time, the things that I'm grateful for, someone else doesn't have that luxury. And that's what my mind goes to. So it's not not being grateful. It's like, hey, wait. And not everybody can experience even just this moment of having a meditation because they're at survival mode every minute. That right there is, is it, it, come, it pops into my mind no matter what. So yes, uh, like if anything, I'm grateful that I can even just have a platform, have a voice to even bring these things to light because it's necessary. So I don't even, I don't even pay attention when people say that because then that means they're so out of touch with how much work we have to do. Yeah. Period. A lot of times I get attacked for my sexuality, especially from religious people online. And so I spend time kind of poking fun at them because they're the number one consumers of my content. It's like, you're so homophobic, but you're watching me more than my audience watches me. What does that say, right? But anyway, so I kind of see all people that battle with me like do think, that. Do you think some but, of that is like closeted people that haven't- Oh, absolutely. Haven't come out. Yeah. Uh, like 89, no, 99%. <laughs> and that's how, that's how I feel. I feel like religious people attack me because they may have some questions about their sexuality. They're like and they projecting. Can't, They're yes, projecting. they yeah, can't yeah. express themselves and so they get mad at those of us that can and can live the life that where we feel comfortable. But then on the other side, they created this, um, they demonize us because they're like, oh, wait, they're, they're, they're putting this in my mind. And this is another reason why I don't like these people or whatever. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of that. But, um, you know, people, people that attack me, I just, I see, I'm, I'm kind of getting off where I was trying to go, but I just, I kind of see that they're just like, I don't know, they just don't have, they don't have that full picture. And so I don't like to spend time with them, but, if I do have those conversations, I try to draw them back to that moment where we got, we were, where we had shared commonality or whatever, like, oh, our family or whatever, so they can re remember that. So there's been often times where I'm like, so I love my niece and nephews, so you love your niece. So if your niece came out of the closet and someone treated her like that, 
what, what would you do? What, how would you think? So it's almost like creating that, those, uh, those, that commonality so that you can use that so that they can understand. Because a lot of times you have to put these ignorant people in the same position. That you have to put them in, I have to put them in my shoes or someone else's shoes in order for them to understand. And so I like doing that. And that's what helps me in conversations with people that I know it's going to be really tough or I'm going to be mad. Cool. Well, thanks for your time today. And of course. I just love what you're doing and any way that I can support you more. And oh, yeah, if people, where can people find you? Yeah, you guys can find me on Amber's Closet on my social media, on YouTube. Um, and I'm also on Facebook and Instagram a lot. So check me out. Yeah. Sweet. I'll link her below. And yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. This is amazing. Man, I can't wait. I'm gonna, I need to borrow this truck. I'm going to party in this thing. Oh, yeah. Let me show you my sound system. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Amber and Midnight Mission. If you enjoyed this video, please go and subscribe to my brand new podcast channel and check out the full-length podcast here. There's lots of amazing guests and exciting episodes coming soon.